And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents. This is Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, and we are coming to you live from the 10 by 10 by 10 Tangent Cube of Science, where we are nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed high atop the Edwards Plateau. And every time we get in here to do a live show these days, Kyle starts changing everything and trying new things <laughs> 30 minutes before the show. So uh, don't blame it on me. Hey, hey, I've hey, been hey. sitting here ready. <laughs> Yeah, well, he's no, he's he's increasing his game for sure on the live stuff. But every time he's like, let's try like 14 experiments when we have 15 minutes I, left. I, I just don't have uh, I don't have enough time. That's all I need. I, I worked on it this weekend. Yeah, you did. I got new camera mounts set up over here and yep. I figured out how to get multiple cameras going and all this stuff. And then, yeah, it last minute. I'm like, let's do it. And then it didn't happen. And we're back to normal. Yeah, but hey, I cleaned up your backdrop. Look at look. Behind yeah, you. it does look better. I wanna... see people asking about your hair. Like, there's nothing different. Yeah, what are you talking about? I don't know what they're. I'm talking not wearing about. the wig. Yeah, he's just he's just not wearing the wig. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I cut, whoa! I, I cut off the tentacles. <laughs> <laughs> she wants me to get. A new I hat. guess you need to buy a hat, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, thanks for the donation for the hat. We'll make sure we get him a, a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> you had good reasons. Laura right. has a, a beautiful painting back here behind Russ, which I stole oh. out of storage. She you doesn't stole even know it. it's in oh, here. Okay. okay. Shh, shh, shh. Maybe Don't she's, tell her. Yeah, maybe she's not watching. But uh, the amplifier, that beautiful Vox amp back there, when Russ kind of does this. Which he does often. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can see my amp. This stupid mic's in the way of it. Ah, oh, there it is. But uh, yeah, it looks better, right? It does. No electrical panel back there. Yeah, it does look better. See? What did you do with the electrical panel? I covered it in a painting. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> well, so the, I, it looks like the main problem is you didn't bring beers. I guess I, I know. I should have brought beers down. I was working on. Um, all this, and mm -hmm. then it didn't happen, and then neither did the beers happen. Well, but when you start taking over the show content, I'll go in and get some. No, oh, you said you were gonna handle all the content <laughs> this week. <laughs> I didn't have time because I was working on the cameras that we didn't use. Well, I tell you what, let's let's uh let's do old format, and okay, uh, yeah, let's uh oh, you know what, old what? format. Oh man, you uh oh. Know me. Look at this. Oh, you're not start that. Yeah. Wow. Someone told me not to forget the record button, and I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. It's on YouTube. So, how long does it take you to pull it up? Oh, it's... it's I got it. Let's see here. There we go. You got it. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> classic. It's classic, folks. Nothing is working. <laughs> it is working. It's just not making any noise. Yeah, it's not making any noise. And that I don't understand. Yeah. Well, anyways, let's have space weather news. Uh, geomagnetic storm watch. Minor G1 class geomagnetic storms are possible on July 13th when a CME is expected to pass close to Earth. NASA and NOAA models of the CME give different results. NASA predicts a glancing blow, NOAA a clean miss. Either way, a close encounter could disturb Earth's magnetic field and produce high latitude auroras. There it is. What was the problem? The board. Oh, of I course. I forgot. <laughs> <It's too laughs> it was working. I just didn't turn it up. Okay. <laughs> so I'll figure this out. This is all new. <laughs> working on doing things live. Yeah. It's going to be great. Eventually. Eventually. I'm, I'm going to make this work Eventually, really good. It will know? be great. <laughs> <laughs> right now, it's pretty sketchy. Okay. Also, something flary this way comes. A big new sunspot is emerging over the sun's northeastern limb, and it is crackling with solar flares. The strongest so far, an M M6 class explosion on July 11th, saturated pixels in the telescope system on board NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory. The extreme ultraviolet, ultraviolet flash ionized the top of Earth's atmosphere, creating a shortwave radio blackout over North America and Doppler shifting the frequency of America's 
WWV time standard radio transmissions. In total, this active region has produced five M-class solar flares in the past 12 hours. An X-class flare may be in the offing. Current conditions, solar wind speed is 332.9 kilometers per second. The density is 4.99 protons per cubic centimeter. Sunspot number is 181. And the uh, neutron count is two, minus 2.1%, which is below average. Uh, KP index is 1.67, which is quiet. 24-hour max is a little higher at 3. And that is your space weather news for the week. Thank you, Sarah. Yep. And we, uh, we could pull up some pictures of this, but uh, this is from The Guardian. Researchers have discovered some of the largest early prehistoric stone tools in Britain, including a foot-long hand axe, almost too big to be hand axe. Oh, yeah. You saw this? I've seen this, yes. Yeah. I posted this in the Discord, actually. Yeah. Um, the excavations, which took place in Kent, revealed prehistoric artifacts in deep Ice Age sediments preserved on a hillside above Medway Valley. Um, yeah, 300,000 years old. These things are beautiful. Yeah. I, I should pull up a, a, you can get a, a picture, picture of yeah. them. Which I'll do in a minute. Um, uh, and now I have one other one. Let's see. See, now they really can't tell us apart. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I was going to say, we look a lot more alike yeah. now. Yeah, yep. Yeah. I'm Russ. <laughs> I'm Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the whole uh, Kyle sounds like the one with longer hair doesn't work anymore, right? It doesn't work. That was the way. It could still work. It could, yeah. I mean, dude. <laughs> <laughs> bro. It still works, bro. <laughs> this is from fizz.org. Why the day is 24 hours long? Astrophysicists reveal why Earth's day was a constant 19.5 hours for over a billion years. A team of astrophysicists at the University of Toronto has revealed how the slow and steady lengthening of Earth's day caused by the tidal pull of the moon was halted for over a billion years. They show that from approximately 2 billion years ago until 600 million years ago, an atmospheric tide driven by the sun countered the effects of the moon, keeping Earth's rotational rate steady and the length of the day at a constant 19.5 hours. Without this billion-year pause in the slowing of our planet's rotation, our current 24-hour day would stretch to over 60 hours. How long would the night be then, I wonder? Mm. Oh, I got a 30-hour night. <laughs> a 30-hour night. <laughs> That's a long time to rock. That is. Yeah. I don't know if I could drink beers for that long. <laughs> <laughs> the study described the result... Uh, uh, the study describing the result... Why the day is 24 hours long, the history of Earth's atmospheric thermal tide, composition, and mean temperature, was published today in the journal Science Advances. Drawing on geological evidence and using atmospheric research tools, the scientists show that the tidal stalemate between the sun and moon resulted from the incidental but enormously consequential link between the atmosphere's temperature and Earth's rotational rate. The paper's authors include Norman Murray, a theoretical astrophysicist with um, University of, well, they say U of T's, Canadian Institute of Theoretical Astrophysics. I bet that guy's a big troll. <laughs> he probably, I mean, he might be an astrophysicist, but he's probably also a hey, troll. <laughs> take it easy on that guy, old boy. <laughs> uh, anyway, a bunch of people with a bunch of names at a bunch of places with long names did stuff. And that was the end of the sentence. <laughs> when the moon first formed some, some 4.5 billion years ago, the day was less than 10 hours long. But since then, the moon's gravitational pull on Earth has been slowing our planet's rotation, resulting in an increasingly longer day. Today, it continues to lengthen at a rate of some 1.7 milliseconds every century. The moon slows the planet's rotation by pulling on Earth's oceans, creating tidal bulges on opposite sides of the planet that we experience as high and low tides. The gravitational pull of the moon on those bulges, plus the friction between the tides and the ocean floor, acts like a break on our spinning planet. Mm -hmm. Sunlight also produces an atmospheric tide with the same type of bulges, says Murray. The sun's gravity pulls on these atmospheric bulges 
producing a torque on the Earth. But instead of slowing down Earth's rotation like the moon, it speeds it up. For most of Earth's geological history, the lunar tides have overpowered the solar tides by about a factor of 10. Hence, the Earth's slowing rotational speed and lengthening days. Sun speeds it up, moon slows it down. <laughs> if this was coming from the sun, like the, the publication, yeah, I would be, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would be suspicious of this source. Consider the blaming source. the moon for slowing it down. <laughs> but some two billion years ago, the atmospheric bulges were larger because the atmosphere was warmer and because its nat natural resonance, the frequency at which waves moved through it matched the length of day. The atmosphere, like a bell, resonates at a frequency determined by various factors, including temperature. In other words, waves, like those generated by the enormous eruption of the volcano Krakatoa in Indonesia in 1883, travel through it at a velocity determined by its temperature. The same principle explains why a bell always produces the same note if its temperature is constant. Throughout most of Earth's history, that atmospheric resonance has been out of sync with the planet's rotational rate. Today, each of the two atmospheric high tides takes 22.8 hours to travel around the world because that resonance and Earth's 24-hour rotational period are out of sync the atmospheric tide is relatively small. But during the billion-year period under study, the atmosphere was warmer and resonated with a period of about 10 hours. Also, at the advent of that epoch, Earth's rotation slowed by the moon reached 20 hours. When the atmospheric resonance and length of day became even factors 10 and 20, the atmospheric tide was reinforced. The bulges became larger, and the sun's tidal pull became strong enough to counter the lunar tide. Along with geological evidence, Murray and his colleagues achieved their result using global atmospheric circulation models, blah, 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 blah. Let's see. Uh... <laughs> Basically, if the world warms up, we're all doomed, <laughs> I think is what they're trying to say. Is that what they're trying to say? <laughs> <laughs> Despite its remoteness in geological history, the result of this adds additional perspective to the climate crisis, you see. Yeah. Because the atmospheric resonance changes with temperature, Murray points out that our current warming in atmosphere could have consequences in this tidal imbalance. <laughs> but anyway, I thought that was interesting. Yeah. A little bit of doom porn there for you. <laughs> but yeah, if it wasn't for the slowing of the, of the, uh, the effect of the moon, we'd have 60-hour days. Wait a minute, I thought... Okay, did I get this mixed up? The sun is... I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah. The sun is speeding it up. Right. And the, the moon, moon is slowing, slowing it down. down. So, so without the slowing effect of the moon, uh, or without that, that pause in the slowing... Yeah. We From the sun, up. we would be... Yeah, that's what... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the sun stopped the slowing for right. a billion years. Yeah. And if that didn't happen, we'd have 60-hour days. Oh, man. Well, people are asking why there's two of me. <laughs> <laughs> what we got here is this. <laughs> oh, yeah. Animator and Fiddler. 27 bucks. Thanks, buddy. Why does it look like two Russes? <laughs> Someone got a shave? No. New shades? Nope. Must be the ears. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Travis, 20 bucks. Contessa and I were wondering who your special guest is, Russ. <laughs> She said she'll send more sweet water blue. Oh, All right. Thank you. That yeah. stuff's good. Yeah, it was good. I, you know, I didn't expect to uh, to like it as much because I'm not much of on the flavor person. But it's actually, those are really good. I do like them a lot. So does Laura. Thank you. What tubes do you use in your Vox app? That's a good question. Um, I think they're EL84s, but uh, I've never changed them. They're stock. And then, of course, you know, the preamp tubes are, I think, 12AX7s. Well, there you go. Could be wrong, but I think that's what they are. Um, ag update, or you got more stories? We got lots of ag stuff. No, I don't that's, have any stories. I did want to tell people, so this is the season uh, right now, all the way up until, what, mid-September? Yeah. So from now, really... I mean, really, it started it started earlier, but uh, from now up to mid-September, uh, we'll do our best to have a show every week, but it may not happen every week because 
we're coming up we're, right now. We're we're we've been working on bottling the wine that we have in the winery. We have lots of barrels full of wine, big tanks full of wine. We're trying to get it into bottle to make room for harvest, which is coming up really quick. Uh, it's going to be August is basically harvest. Yeah, we'll probably <clears throat> we might be harvesting some stuff like at the end of, of uh, July. Yeah. But. I don't know. I haven't tested anything. Right. Yet. We testing is going to happen later Thursday. this week. Yeah. So uh, once the harvest starts happening, then we're going to be moving lots of grapes around, many tons of grapes around. Some of it will go into our winery. Others were taken to a different facility. Then we start the fermentation process. All of this is like, uh, I mean, it's a lot of fun, but it's also a lot of work. Many long days. Uh, lots of chemical testing and then you know you're pressing and you're or you're crushing you're destemming you're moving lots of material around so um we may not get be able to get a show out every week for the next couple of months we'll we'll see you know we're, we'll try but yeah. sometimes we're just going to be exhausted you know <laughs> uh so i did want to say that so that's happening and actually tomorrow we're we're going to do a bottling run on some white right what is yeah. it yeah it's uh trebbiano trebbiano yeah like three, uh, what is it, 270 gallons? No, it's now 330-something, 336 maybe. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, cause I mean, it's in the I, big tank. Yeah. It's weird how we gained gallons after we filtered and definitely lost some gallons. But, you know, you put it in a different tank. That tank says, here's how many gallons per inch. And then I measure that tank, and it's 336. Yeah. Where it was in a 300-gallon tank, and then I don't know. Anyways, it's around 300 gallons. It's magic. This is magic. Yeah. But I have to plan. I mean, I have to buy labels for the bottles. And then I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> I'll make I guess bottles. I'll plan for 336 <laughs> gallons. <Yeah. laughs> hey, Bruce, 20 bucks for the 30 hours of beer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, buddy. <laughs> uh, the other part of the ag update is the bees. So I got a bunch of equipment to do I think I told you guys this to do proper honey extraction and I wasn't you know I'm never I never have planned on really harvesting a bunch of honey from these hives because that's not what they're for I've said this before but I did want to try getting a proper honey harvest um last year when I went to check I I basically waited until I was going to winterize the hives which basically means um removing some uh, screens from the top that l allow air flow through the hive to let hot air out and putting on, uh, taking the screens out and putting on, uh, like insulating boards instead of the screens so that the, so that the hives retain heat. That's all I have to do for winterization, but it is important, an important process. And so when I was going to winterize the hives last year, when I opened them up, they ha were loaded. All of them were loaded at the top with uh, comb full of honey. So I did harvest one frame from one hive that had the most, uh, and it was really good. And so I thought this year, well, I'll try, uh, harvesting more, maybe take, I was thinking maybe I could get four frames per hive. So that would, you know, we have four hives, right? So 16 frames of honey, that would be a, quite a bit, uh, that we could just share amongst ourselves. And when I was reading about it, people were like, oh, yeah, you should harvest during peak honey flow. And they were su suggesting that that's early July, mid-July. So that's like right now. So I, um, the other day I went out and checked, and uh, they don't have a bunch of honey up there. So I don't know what the deal is with that, but I'm going to check them again in September or whatever. Before it starts getting cold, when I go to winterize the hives, I'll try to do it at the same time. Because maybe... I don't know what I was reading may have been something else, but the point is they have a bunch of comb, which means that they're planning to <laughs> fill it with honey, but it isn't full yet. So a couple of the hives did have quite a bit up there, but they're definitely not full like they were last year. Uh, and last year they were far more stressed than they are this year. So I expect that they'll be incredibly full later on in the year. So that's the only other thing I could think of for the ag update, right? Sounds good. God dang. God dang. God dang. There we go. What, oh, you're pulling up the... There's a cool 3D model of this thing, uh, this giant hand axe I wanted to... Sh yeah. Let's see if we can yeah. take a look so at it. So Kyle's pulling up one of the giant... Yeah. I mean, I want to find this first. <laughs> look at that thing. <laughs> i got to find this. 
<laughs> Let me show it here. Um, okay, there it is. Yep, that's definitely need to find that, right? I mean, that's my dream. Yeah, you know, it it looks like a pickaxe. Like, I know it is. It does have a hand axe design, but it is the size of like a proper, you know, pickaxe point. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Man, that's amazing. This is cool that they scanned this thing and like, yeah, this is on the, this is from the actual, uh, the journal where they uh, wrote the story about this thing. Uh, how do I zoom? There we go. Yeah, they have this cool 3D model. Yeah, that's really cool. Well, we got some good questions in here. Okay, well, what's the amb ambient temperature there this week? Over 100 degrees? Yeah. Well, let me look it up. It's been hot. It's 8.30 right now. Um, we're going to have three-digit temperatures uh, for the next many days. It's 95.4 yeah. degrees at the vineyard, about a few feet above the tops of the canopies of the grapes. And it's 8.30, so. It's 8.30 in the evening. Uh, do you guys use wooden barrels? Yes. Yeah, That's French oak. Yes, French oak uh, for the red wine for sure. Uh, the white is usually in steel or poly. Um, Today it got to 111.7 degrees at the vineyard. Yeah, it got hot. It was definitely hot today. So, Oh, wait. Is that wind speed? <laughs> wait, wait, Kyle can't. He can read a thermometer. <laughs> Trust me, folks. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess that. I would believe 110. No, yeah, that was it. Yeah. No. It says outdoor temperature 102 ish. Yeah, sorry. 102. Okay. I was looking at the wrong. Graph. It might have been one at 110 over at uh, West Cave. That was the feels like temperature, right? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Because of it course, it feels like you're yeah, dying. It feels worse than <laughs> yeah. it actually is. Like, yeah, you, it's that's just a that's just a statement. It's about, an incredibly scientific measurement. <laughs> that's what it feels about, like about modern, you know, the modern psyche is just like, oh, it's way worse than it actually is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then when it gets cold, it feels even colder than it is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, question: Why were the bees stressed? Okay, because so last year. We moved the hives, uh, and there's this really interesting dynamic uh, where you can, when you move hives, if you move them a short distance, it's okay. Short distance meaning like 100 feet at most, 50 feet, something like that. Or if you move them a very long distance, like 10 miles or more, then you're okay. But if you move them farther than 50 or 100 feet, but less than two miles, um, which is what we had to do. Uh, they can get lost, and we did lose some. Uh, and that's because, well, I mean, I don't know. This is, you know, when I was reading about it, people were like, well, bees orient themselves based on what they can see, and I don't know how anybody actually knows any of this, but if you don't move them many miles away where when they come out of the hive, they don't recognize anything. So if they come out of the hive and they just completely don't recognize their location whatever way that they do, whatever method they use to recognize, they'll reorient themselves and they won't get lost. If you move them a very short distance, like less than 100 feet, they'll fly almost, like if they go out, they'll come back almost to the right place where the hive was, but it's close enough to where they can smell the pheromones and they can get back into it, right? So they don't get lost. But if you move them more than 100 feet, but less than two miles, they come out of the hive, they recognize the, l the wider landscape, they fly off to do uh, foraging, and then they come back to where the hive used to be, and then they can't find it. Uh, so this is part of the reason they were stressed. So we basically had to go over there at night when they're all in the hive, and we locked the whole, you know, you close off the entrance and seal up the entire thing, and we put bands around it and then move them uh, out into a wider field so that they would be uh, away from a lot of the activity that's happening in the vineyards and, and near the fruit trees. And also um, under a giant oak tree, so they had a little bit of shade. Right, a little bit of shade. And they're all next to each other, so I don't have to go to multiple different places to take care of the hives. Now they're now they're like lined up in a row. They have, there's like, they're set up on some nice big rocks, so they're stable. 
it's a really good spot, but we had to move them. And they, uh, you know, they freaked out. Uh, obviously, moving the hives freaks them out. And then when you open it up the next morning, there's some tricks you can do to try to force them to reorient themselves. Not all, It doesn't always work. And every hive lost like a, kind of a, like a, a handful of, of older foragers that just went out and then went back to where the hive was. And for a long time, there was like a ball of bees nearby where the old hive was that I couldn't ever, you know, you can't replace them. So they just end up dying there. So a bunch of the hives lose their experienced foragers at the end of the of the day when you do that. But we didn't lose them entirely, which is really good. So we did a good job in moving them. And we had to, it had to be done. But that's why they were stressed, because uh, we had to move them in the middle of the season. This year, they're not. They know where they are. Everything's fine. They they woke up after the winter season. They they hatched a million new bees, and they started going to work. Uh, they've calmed way down. Last year, they were very agitated after we moved them for a long time. They've calmed way down. I can basically go over there without a, a bee suit on anymore. You know, they'll fly around and check you out, but they don't. Like, last year, they were always angry um, after we moved them. They were angry for a long time. Who's this guy buzzing around our freaking hive? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I'm I'm expecting them to to uh, to be very productive this year, and it looks like they are being productive. And so I'm just saying, uh, yeah. Last year they were stressed, and they had they still had hives full of honey. So I'm expecting them to be to do good this year as well. Sweet. Yeah. Good good questions. All right. What else? You got rock and roll updates? You're selling records? Oh, yeah, that's right. We released the record to the public for sale on July 4th and completely forgot to tell anybody about it. <laughs> <laughs> We're so good at marketing. <laughs> it's our specialty. Um, but, yeah, it's available at uh, $50dynasty.com. And, yeah, it's, we're just using Shopify so you can go and order it, and we are doing um, overseas shipping. Mm. So, I mean, you know, that – Expense is added on, so it's, you know, it's, yeah. it can get pretty high. But, yeah, they've been selling, and we've had people join the Patreon. It's been great. Um, and we got the big rock coming this weekend. Oh, the big rock. <laughs> That's what we call it. We're actually getting together for a whole weekend to rock out, and we're calling it the big rock. <laughs> Yeah, the big <laughs> rock. It's like a, it's a mystery how it got moved here. No one knows. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I won't be here for this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna be out of town. Yeah, it's just yeah. it's it's yeah. We're gonna be going over to Byman's and just kind of like trying to trying to put this show together. Mm. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. But yeah, the record is beautiful. It's awesome. Go go buy it if you if you have a record player or if you don't. If you just want to look at a cool record for some reason. <laughs> yeah. All right. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um, we didn't have much on the agenda for this week, and, and uh, we've been really busy at work. Uh, so we were trying to figure out what are we going to do, and uh, Ed Food text you later. I don't know if he's in there. He's definitely in there. Okay. Bro. Shout out to you, buddy. Yeah, I still haven't sent him my the papers that I was reading, so I got to do that. Oh, I man. Do, I know. He's I'm been asking slack. for this. I'll do it. When He's you're, demanding when his, you your actually, papers. When you actually take over the show content, I will I will do it. <laughs> but uh, he, uh, he sent us the link to um, a YouTube video that he had watched, which is how we had that very lucrative conversation about um, uh, the the – concentric circles of walls or retaining walls within these enclosures in Gobekli Tepe. Yeah. Uh, so the, the podcast is called the prehistory guys. Yep. And it's on YouTube and the episode is, uh, Gobekli Tepe revealed what we know in 2022 with Dr. Lee Clare. Yeah. Who's written quite a few papers on this. He's, he's part of the Tepe telegrams team. Yes. He's, uh, uh, he's written an excellent summary paper of like what the state of knowledge is, at, at least at the time that he wrote the paper. He kind of goes through and says, here's what was initially found and what was initially thought. And then the basic problem I think that emerges is that when it started to become, a, you know, a World Heritage Site, they this narrative about the site and what it was developed 
And then there's a kind of a marketing campaign for these heritage sites, and they built this massive visitor center. They spent millions of dollars on it, clearly. Uh, and the whole, you know, so they have all this stuff like saying it's the zero point in time. It's like the start. The first temple. Yeah, the first temp, world's first temple. And like all of this stuff now is no longer considered to be the case in, in the scientific thinking, including the idea that it was intentionally buried in some However, mysterious way. The intentionally buried narrative is not the result of marketing and the public mm -mm. because it's very prominent in many of the papers written so, by the scientists saying it's clearly buried. So is the other stuff. Uh, it comes. This other stuff comes from this the early thoughts on what it was. What he's basically saying before when they were focused on the um, layer three monumental structures, mm -hmm. which are the T pillars and everything that we all know about. Uh, and they didn't know about the, uh, you know, they hadn't yet found any residential buildings or evidence of long-term settlements, which they do, he thinks at least, they now have. That people live there, mm -hmm. you know, they've found burials at least. He's mentioned it. He didn't say where they found these burials. I think they might be in the layer two structures, you know, that there's human bones. Also in one of the cisterns he mentions in this show. That they found human long bones at the bottom of one of the cisterns where they're supposed to be collecting water. So I'm like, okay, is it yeah. really a cistern? That's what I. Well, I think it was. <laughs> this is a. This is another thing. There's so much in this in this podcast. It's really good. Um, I wanted to play a couple of clips from it, but you know, uh, I was uh, trying to get cameras to work and then I <laughs> ran out of time. We probably should take a break. Actually, oh, we're taking a we're taking breaks every thirty minutes. I mean, we don't have to. Well, we can, but. Uh, well, let me finish. Yeah, yeah. Go um, ahead. Basically, I was going to say about the cisterns that it it to me it falls under the same problem as all of the other megalithic and rock cut stuff. Yeah, like you can't date you can't the cistern. Date it. You, you can't can date find, the construction. You of it, can yeah. find PPNA and PPNB bones in it. Yeah, that doesn't tell you. And, and he did point this out that it, it it's that so, it's at least that old. Yeah. Right? So to, so to be clear for anybody who hasn't been following this stuff. Completely, the PP and A just means pre-pottery Neolithic, A and B. Uh, this is basically a, a. These are terms that are naming a kind of lithics, really, and things associated with the lithics, like debitage of cultural artifacts. Um, this is stuff that's been identified mu in a much wider area, not just in the Gobekli Tepe area, but they find these same kinds of lithics uh, in the Gobekli Tepe diggings, right? In the in the midden, down in the enclosures themselves. And so down at the bottom, they're finding PPNA, which is the oldest version of this, as we put it at 9,000, what was it, 9,000 BC something? Hey, how come I didn't take my list out here? Yeah, keep going. Uh, so in other, in other words, they, they've been dating certain layers in Gobekli Tepe based on the lithics that they're finding in them. And PP and A is the earliest stuff down at the bottom. PP and B is later stuff. And it's associated with, uh, more square structures that are kind of around the big monumental ones. So the big monumental structures with the big T pillars are still the oldest things. And no one knows what those are dated to because you can't date it. But it is clear that the people who were making these kinds of lithics uh, were occupying this 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 site for a long time. Okay, Kyle's pulling up a paper here with some of the... Yeah, and I realized, okay, this should work. There, there it is, go. yeah. Um, so yeah, this is the type of stuff here. Uh, I, and, and this is another thing we were, we were talking about recently, is that really this, this kind of stuff and I, I could be wrong about this and i would like to ask this guy we would love to get yeah this we want to get this show. guy on the show for sure he's an interesting guy this is the kind of stuff like the lithics that has was was already established you know this is already known about from so many other mounds in in the levantine um and these t-pillars with these carvings are now associated yeah with the with the pre-pottery Neolithic, right? If you a. go to if you go to Wikipedia and look at look up PPN, you know the pre-pottery Neolithic uh, stuff, you'll see like these little bitty uh, and sometimes larger, uh, basically flint arrowhead types, and then they're showing Gobekli Tepe pillars as well. 
as if they have any right so association with each other except for the fact that there was a pile of these things inside the enclosures so this is where it gets in my opinion it's it's being confused at this point because because Gobekli Tepe has been associated with the PPNA due to the lithics found at the bottom layers inside the enclosures now when you look up the PPNA you see Gobekli Tepe right. and you see the pillars so you've got this stonework next to this type of uh, polished or you know high relief carved limestone uh, with these artistic reliefs, giant megalithic pillars, and that's considered also PPNA materials. <laughs> so uh, it's so going back to the cistern. Yes, the cistern may have had PPNA or PPNB or or at least bones that dated back to those periods. But that doesn't mean the cistern was made during those times. Now, of course not, no. If it was used as a water source for the original people who were doing, you know, this carving these tea pillars, um, then later these uh, hunter-gatherers came. Yeah, and, and they started... find a, a useful system, right? Because yeah. he's saying, he's or like... Or they There's... start making sacrifices into this thing or yes, something like that. Yes, that's what I thought too. They're making sacrifices. He's because like, oh, the bones th have scratches that are associated is... with the secondary burial. And I'm like, you mean sacrifices? Yeah, and this is the <laughs> other thing that, that I would say about, uh, about the idea that they weren't... That they were hunter-gatherers yeah. and that they weren't cultivating crops and, and they weren't uh, domesticating animals and all that kind of stuff. Right. Well, those are the those are the PPNA and PPNB people mm. that were doing all of that because they're not really looking at like who they're not making the the a distinction, a distinction between who built the megalithic and rock cut stuff. Yeah. OK, but we're Although, getting OK, weeds. but it is true, though, we, we have to say it is true that in quite a few of the papers we've read about dating the sites that they specifically say that they can date the materials that are found in the midden that's in the enclosures, that they've been able to date some of the charcoal bits that they found in the mortar that are on the rough uh, cobble walls that go around the enclosures, but that obviously there's no way to date the enclosures themselves or the megalithic architecture. So they do make it clear in the papers. They say this. Right. They also make it clear that they were obviously intentionally buried at the end of their use lives. That's I mean, right. that's almost a direct quote yeah. from multiple papers. And so this guy is saying, well, you know, he kind of, he's he's saying that the intentional buried narrative is not disproven. It's just that there's a better, they're not, you know, it's they have other research now and other data that they're starting to look at. Yeah. Uh, and then and then basically what Ed Fu texts you later, <laughs> He says we can call him Ed Fu. Okay, Ed Fu. <laughs> <laughs> what he was talking about was that, you know, the idea that these these maybe retaining walls or these rock walls were they kept building them smaller and smaller because maybe there was collapse and um that's kind of one of the ideas but another thing that he says, Dr. um Claire. Lee is it Lee? Dr. Lee Claire is saying is that it looks like the very first the, first of all they're saying that these special buildings they don't want to call them temples anymore yeah these special buildings started out large like that that they have been modified so many times over possibly many centuries um that they start out with these big large circular enclosures and then uh Later, they come back and they build a smaller one on the inside of that and then a smaller one and with yeah. the T-pillars and everything. Yeah. I don't think that's – I just highly doubt that. The reason I doubt that is because the two central pillars are literally – that's where the rock cut yeah. pedestals are. And then there's this, there's this you know, curb in the bedrock – Going yeah, around like a, a bench central... or a curb, yeah. And we can show maybe a, we can find pull up a picture of this. Um, but it's it's just. I feel like it's a it's a it's a solid plan, and we have we have a, another paper we can pull up and look at and talk about. So there's a good question here: Has anyone dug deeper than the base of the structures? Well, the, that's the thing is that the 
the base of the megalithic architecture is actually there's it's set into a rock cut platform where basically the people who made it dug down to the bedrock flattened the bedrock out and left some pedestals and a bench going around and then socketed the t pillars into the bedrock so you can't there is no digging deeper uh than the than the bottom of the enclosures because it's just they're sitting on rock that's been beautifully flattened uh in this amazing way and maybe kyle can pull up some stuff and we can show it uh yeah p photographs i would have to do that yeah we could but i mean yeah I this know. is good okay yeah I'll show this because we can just make it clear like so we're looking directly down on what is this uh this is, this is enclosure c. c enclosure c those two t pillars that are the big ones in the middle are sitting on rock cut pedestals those big square things that they're sitting on those are part of the bedrock and then there's this, the big circle there is flattened bedrock. So somebody dug all the way down and flattened it out and left the pedestals. Yeah, so all this whole rim. And then when you, if in certain places, if you look close here, like from the side, you can see that there's actually a curb on yeah. the bedrock that comes up. And then the rock wall here is sitting on top of that curb. And then there's one of these, just the bedrock portion outside of the entire mound of Gobekli Tepe on the bare rock hilltop. Yeah. When you're walking up to the site, you can look out there and see it. Yeah. You see the two raised uh, uh, pedestals here. One of them's pretty heavily eroded. And then you see a little curb going around part yeah. of it. And it's kind of this oval, interesting and, shape. And there's no midden there. That's the thing is these, the, the well-known enclosures that you always see on the discovery channel or in all the documentaries and in the pictures these are actually like deep down inside this enormous mound of material like it's 300 what did you 300 meters it's 300 meters in diameter in diameter and many many me meters deep and so th that's the hill it's actually it's actually on top of this hill there's a big hill and then there's this enormous mound of stuff on top of that hill that's full of lithics this ppna and ppnb stuff it's evidence of an enormous amount of uh like settlement like people living there and you know making a, this midden it's like trash stuff it's got little bones in it and bits of charcoal and like pieces of tools all this stuff and the, the enclosures themselves, the famous ones, are down inside this midden. But outside of this giant midden mound, but on the same hill, right at the edge of where the hill starts to slope down steeply, there's another rock-cut platform that has no pillars associated with it. If there were pillars there, they're long gone. P you know, the, I think the, the, the standard model explanation is this was a test thing, and it, they screwed it up, and then they... Or it was an old one that was had yeah was done with its use life or whatever, and then... Right. They but it's completely outside of the mound it's just sitting out there in the open and it's just a it's just a circular inset like a See, cut platform yeah that that i think i'm starting i'm beginning to think now well i think i read somewhere or heard from someone that maybe that one had a little bit of midden material on top of it the uh, idea i got was like inches versus mm. like being super thick and they they dug it out cleaned it out yeah i mean so, that makes sense yeah it had a little bit of but it's outside of this massive mound. It's like yes, not it's in the mound. Yeah. But the thing, the thing that it makes me think is that sort of the peak of the mound would be like in the center of where everybody was kind of yeah. gathering for for however many thousands of years these you know from PP and A to PP and B into medieval times and into modern times. There's stuff there from all of that, and that you know. Uh, yes, they may have come and found what I think is a possibility is that the megalithic and rock cut stuff was there without a mound. Right. And that people, the PPNA people, you know, the people of that time period found it and occupied the site, whether they, and they may have, obviously now they're finding out that they lived there and stuff, but yes, they weren't necessarily domesticating animals and crops. But that that is when the beginning of this sort of rebuilding, maybe these T pillars are laying all over the place, broken. Yeah. And they start standing them back up and building little rock walls. And I mean, if anything is going to drive a, a, a people into a sort of a, a construction minded 
culture or civilization, it would be finding something like that. And you're like, we got to restore this. This is like a place of the gods or whatever. Yeah. And you start standing pillars up and like putting, jamming rocks in yeah, there you to try learn, to hold you, them up. Yeah, you start learning things. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because this guy, sorry, I don't want to interrupt you no, completely, but this guy, Lee Clare, Dr. Lee Clare says that PP, the PPNB uh, residential structures start out round and oval yeah. and then slowly he was like they invent the the corner <laughs> right so you can see you you can see this other narrative this other possibility is that these people find these round megalithic sites and then they start trying to restore them they're standing up they're dragging fallen tea pillars around they're trying and then they're they're looking at the sculptures and they're like wow we can make that and that would explain some of the more rough sculptured artifacts mm -hmm. around the place right They've got cisterns and there's uh, – and the cisterns are – I haven't seen any of these, but based on what this guy was saying, they're put in strategic places where water runoff from the hill is channeled into dug channels in the rock mm -hmm. so that it falls into the cistern, right? So they have this whole system where you can live on top of this hill because it collects water for you, yeah. and then they, they can make shelters for themselves. And then they start learning from the structures – how to build houses and now they're stacking up cobbles and they're making themselves little round houses and they figure out, well, it's easier to put a roof on a square one. Yeah. So then they start making, they are adjusting their round houses into square houses, which is what we ah. see now when you're walking around. Uh, is... And there's a question here about midden. Yeah, it's M-I-D-D-E-N, midden. It's not mitten, uh, midden. And it, it does kind of mean landfill. It's just all the stuff that people generate by living in an area it's animal bones debitage from humans yes it's debitage we we uh we call it midden midden but that might be a little texan i don't know we because we were thinking about maybe it's pronounced midden midden i don't know but in texas you found a midden mound <laughs> it's midden <laughs> <laughs> old son <laughs> an artificial heel <laughs> that's right uh Oh, okay. So a point about the going back to these concentric circles, uh, and I kind of started, I, I went off on a tangent, but um, one of the things about this idea that the circles started large and then they kept getting smaller and smaller, if you started out with a large one and then put a roof on it, mm. then you're going to come back later and build a smaller one inside of it, mm. or is that roof? collapsed and yeah. destroyed and, and then you and the mound is washing in yeah yeah so you so build a new just... retaining wall and a new roof yeah <laughs> i really want to talk to this guy because yeah. i want to know is is anyone considering the possibility that all of the megalithic rock cut stuff was one phase and then later... there's at least one paper i read where they said that okay. based on geometries this right? is this paper that i have pulled up yeah and i i think we should go through it a little bit okay and we could do that after a break or something. Yeah, we take a break. I gotta go get some beers. Mm, yeah, we need some beers. Yeah, forty-five minutes. Which is it's actually longer because you didn't. Yeah, I know. I didn't hit the <laughs> it's it's classic. <laughs> All right, we'll be right back, folks. Thanks for sticking around. <laughs> Hold on, wait. Okay, what? Don't say that just Don't yet. Don't say it yet. Okay. I gotta start something. I'll wait on, the... on. Oh, yeah, this is fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll be right back.
we are back, ladies and gentlemen, Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, live. And uh, still trying to figure out this live thing, but, you know, <laughs> just stick with me, folks. If you listen to the very first, second episode of the podcast, <laughs> you know, it's pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> so it might take us a while, but we'll get there. Yeah, we have a whole, like, uh, you know, learn it while you're doing it yeah. philosophy. That's right. <laughs> just, All right. <laughs> you wanna? I'll take a course, buddy. We'll see, I know he he'll, he'll only drink one, so I bought big ones. <laughs> <laughs> Good strategy. <laughs> Where's the? Uh, we had a couple of here. Oh, okay, that'll work. I'll have uh, a Modelo. All right, especial. But I don't have a. Cheers, y'all! Thanks for being in the chat. Yeah, cheers, everybody. I have a lighter. Cheers. Yeah, thanks to those of you in the live chat asking great questions. And thanks to the, those of you who will watch this later. We really, we really appreciate it. Yeah, it's good uh, when we don't really have enough material for an entire show to just go live, and then we can get questions. Yeah, they, get, they ask great questions. Yeah. And, and good complaints. Yep. There's some really good ones in there. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> like, get to Gobekli Tepe, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you please talk about Gobekli Tepe? <laughs> uh, so should we go over this paper? This is interesting. I mean... Yeah, yeah. Let's see some of this. This is a good paper. Yeah. Read it quite a while ago, but um, we could maybe, I don't know, summarize some of the stuff. Why is it doing that? I need continuous... Let's see. Continuous scroll. And you can also just put it up on the screen so they can see it. That's what I'm going to do. Okay. Um, but yeah, where do you want to start here? Ah, some of the geometry. Yeah. Okay. So, so I, yeah, these guys, this is an interesting paper. I'm not sure how much this is, you know, you can never, you can't really tell. Like, I, would, I guess we'd have to look for responses. Uh, but these guys um, were doing geometrical analysis using computers and, and a kind of algorithm. I don't really understand all of it, obviously, but they basically are saying that these three enclosures that are shown here, B, C, and D, D is the famous one with the huge, uh, huge T-pillars with the arms. Uh, C is the one we were looking at earlier that has the big, the, the pillars that are wider or thicker that are broken. Um, but that these three enclosures are associated with each other geometrically in such a way that it implies that whoever made these structures had to build these three all together with a single plan. This is kind of like, it's sort of like um, reading this reminded me of some of the stuff I've seen about Giza. People have made this similar argument about Giza. They're like, look, the way this is laid out, you can't say, well, some, you know, one pharaoh just put a pyramid over here and then he died. And then the next pharaoh was like, well, I also want a pyramid there. And then he put it. In other words, they're saying it has to be a one single plan because it's of the way it's all linked together. And that's what these guys are basically saying. Yeah. And by the way, the title, Geometry and Architectural Planning at Gobekli Tepe, Turkey, yeah. uh, by uh, these guys. Gil Hackley and Avi, Avi Gopher. So yeah, this is pretty cool. They're saying it. I think it was within 22 centimeters of being an equilateral triangle from these central uh, points. Yeah. Uh, between these three enclosures, so their I, I think their their main point is that this looks like um, that that this site was planned and engineered in its entirety, or at least these three enclosures mm -hmm. that they looked at. Yeah. Um. And and so that that counters. The archaeological narrative that is that, you know, one site was built and then it was intentionally buried and then they built another one. Yeah. Right. And that was intentionally buried. I mean, so and again, I, I'm not saying that this guy, Lee Clare, in the in the interview is claiming that the intentionally buried narrative was a was a uh, is wrong, was a um, a problem of, um, you know, the main like. What am I trying to say? Marketing. 
He was not claiming that no, from no. the marketing firm. Right. He's saying that the marketing picked it up from the papers, from the science at the yes. time, and now it's embedded in the it's like embedded in like everyone's mind, right? He's like, it's out there in all these different places, and now the science has moved on from that idea, and it's difficult, you know, because the scientists the science are now thinking differently, but because the marketing took this idea and mass marketed it to the whole world, it's sort of embedded in the in the popular ideas about the site itself. Yeah, and I I feel like here we go. Here's a here's a good diagram. Hey, look, you got uh, Ed Poo's continuing this. Yeah, lucrative so he's he's <laughs> <laughs> it was a very lucrative conversation. <laughs> um, so yeah, he's Ed Fu is saying that he had the same idea that the megalithic was clearly first, and he thought that that Lee was potentially hinting that it was a different phase um, to make the later smaller interior structures. Because what I think Lee is saying. Is when you look at this, you see this this outer ring around around uh, enclosure C here, like that. This was first, and these pillars were put in first, and then later they came back and built this this in interior uh, ring. Um, I was wondering if that is supposed to contain the central pillars as well, because they look contemporary yeah. with with the uh, you know these surrounding pillars. I don't know. It's it's kind of hard to tell. But yeah, uh, the the point that I've really been kind of that, that really has struck me is that these rock walls in between these columns, this is just bad building. Like you, you don't want to put a divider right here in a rock wall. That's just going to make this portion of the rock wall weak because it can be pushed down here because there's it's not really interlocking with the other part of the rock wall. It's got this big flat smooth yep. surface in between what should be a continuous wall and therefore it, it, it's weak um, and that you see that all over in these areas so this is if you were going to build a retaining wall this is a terrible way to build a retaining wall um so i would imagine like what i think is a really cool idea and i uh, is that this is reconstruction like this is an ancient form of archaeology even if this site even if the megalithic architecture was only a couple hundred years old, it still looks like later people came along and said, "Okay, it's fallen down. Like let's let's yeah. stand these columns up and build these walls to hold it up." And if they didn't have the capability to um, excavate or you know cut into the bedrock and anchor these columns where they were supposed to be, or or some other method of yeah. anchoring them, then maybe they would have built these little rock walls to hold them up. I just think that's a cool idea. Of course, I can't prove that. It's, you know, it's just, it just doesn't look like the same phase of building. And Dan's making a good point. These are only a fraction of the site. Yes. So it's hard to generalize. Uh, yes, they're only talking about these three enclosures in this specific instance. They're just yeah. saying because the architectural or the uh, archaeological narrative at the time that they were writing the paper was sort of that each enclosure was built in succession. Not not according to a general plan, but like you have one and then it's decommissioned and then you have the next one and it's decommissioned and then you have the next one is decommissioned and this and some time passes. He's like they're basically saying no, at least with these three enclosures, with the measurements we made, it implies that it was a single plan and that these three all had to be built together as part of a of, of a single effort, not one after the other. But you're right. You can't make you can't take this and generalize for the whole site itself. Because there's so much still under the ground. Right. And I think that's also um going back to the interview, I'll mention it again. It's on uh the prehistory guys YouTube channel. Gobekli Tepe revealed what we know in twenty twenty two with Dr. Lee Claire. Um really good. I, I would like to pull some clips from this at some point because there's there's multiple things, um, multiple interesting things that this guy's talking about. But yeah, the the idea that uh, they are just at the, you know, the tip of the iceberg in this in this discovery. I mean, Gobekli Tepe still has so much to offer in terms of uh, data. There's still so much left that has not been dug. Um, <laughs> and then on top of that, they found dozens, if not uh, maybe, I mean, he says they found over 
more than a dozen other sites like Gobekli Tepe, but that was in 20, that was, I guess, just a year ago. Yeah. Uh, maybe they found more. We heard when we were there that, that it was up to 40, possibly even 80. Yeah. Uh, so it's hard to, hard to know what the real <laughs> deal is, but at the point of this interview a year ago, he's saying more than a dozen yeah. other sites. So there's just, there's still so much to, to uncover. And that's the thing. Karahan Tepe is the other sort of, sort of semi-famous site that's associated with this. They know it's older, at least several centuries, maybe more, 500, 600 years. Uh, but it's it can be deceptive because when you go around, you see the T-pillars, but they're small, you know, maybe three or four feet, maybe five at the most. But there's this massive rock-cut circular enclosure, one side of which has this enormous rock-cut bench that looks like they intentionally left parts of the stone to have it look like T-pillars. Mm-hmm. And then they're... Uh, in in the middle of it, you can't walk down in there because it's an active archaeological site. But in this massive circular enclosure that's been carved out of the bedrock, there are these huge uh, pillars that are completely fragmented, like they were they fell over and just burst. And now the archaeologists have sort of f- put the pieces back together and they're laying on the ground. So it's interesting because it it's it's you can see the. Uh, the architectural similarity to the plate to a place like Gobekli Tepe, but it it also has differences. Um, and Karahan, you know, does have lots of occupation around it, and many square buildings as well. Uh, and then it also has what look like maybe cisterns with pillars in them, all rock cut except for one that's that is supposed to be a guy carrying a a leopard or something. Was it a a, a cat? Uh, maybe a, a puma. Yeah, or something like that. So anyway, you can see the similarities, but the pillars themselves are also absolutely enormous. Uh, Kyle's pulling up pictures, you know. Yeah, I can show these, but uh, I was going to look for a good one. Um, Let's see here. But there's just lots of different interesting ideas going around, and obviously lots more more archaeology needs to be done before we know, we really know what's going on. But it does look like there was a very large number of people in this area doing similar things. So this is that... that, um, cut wall with the bench here and then there's these protrusions coming out uh this is not the greatest p- position to look at this but then there's these these are the huge this is one of the huge uh t pillars that's fallen over and fragmented here's another one yeah laying on the ground i can probably find a better uh photograph in that let me look for one um you know another thing i just thought of <laughs> That that could be an argument against what I've been saying about these these rock walls is that that rock cut portion with the big bench at the bottom resembles the T pillars with the rock wall bench. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. It does. I guess if they were just looking for a specific, because because they also say that that area was plastered, right? That those yeah. rock walls were plastered, so it would have looked the same yeah. as Karahan Tepe. Yeah. Uh, and I have to go back to the first time we went there. <laughs> um, Carahan has so much to to offer here, I think, in terms of, of understanding Gobekli Tepe. So, yeah, here's basically what these would have been T-pillars. Yeah. But they're just part of the bedrock. Mm-hmm. And then there's this two steps coming down. And this is what, so when you look at an enclosure in Gobekli Tepe, you're looking down into this flattened bedrock area here. And then on the edge, you see this raised bench of the natural bedrock. And then the T pillars are literally standing right at the edge of that bench going around. So it's just like this. And then it comes back a little bit and there's a rock wall. Mm -hmm. Now, in a lot of cases, the rock walls are right up to the edge of the bench as well, and they're covering the T-pillar here, so yeah. that isn't the same. And uh, that's part of the argument about like that you would make about it you know, not being contemporary with the pillars themselves is because it covers oh, up the artwork, right? I it's, have my cursor in the, in the wrong place. Oh. Yeah, this is, the, this is the bedrock, flattened bedrock. Then here's the step up where in Gobekli Tepe, a lot of rock walls start b- being built right here, right on top of this curb. 
But it also, you know, this is what I was trying to point out, that it comes back. Then there's this bench, which there's definitely rock walls in Gobekli Tepe that look like this. There's like a bench, then it comes back, and then there's more rock walls. So this does resemble some of the rock wall and pillar and megalithic pillar construction at Gobekli Tepe a little bit. So that could be. And then this is all limestone, people are asking. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's 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 limestone like all of this area is big limestone hills so what were you saying i i interrupted you because i was like pointing at all this stuff in the wrong window but no I idea <laughs> you forgot what he was saying already <laughs> um maybe i can find this uh cistern thing i mean i know there's one at, that that huge one at carahan but a yeah. lot of people have seen that um Let's see. You could, sh I mean, you could leave this on there so they can see you scrolling through the pictures. You don't have to. I wonder if I can get rid of this <laughs> side view thing. <laughs> All right, I'll do it. So yeah, that we were just we were just showing you guys the geometric uh, paper there because it's interesting, you know, that people are looking at different possibilities uh, enough to write a paper on what they've found that uh, have different ideas on what was going on at these sites. Um, you know, whether they're right or not, it, it's, we don't know. But there, the point is, is that there is a discussion going on and these, these academics are trying to figure out what's, you know, all the different possibilities. So it, it seems like, what I, I guess what I'm trying to say is in the popular narrative, the, the articles you read about it or whatever, it comes across as there's this single idea about what's going on here, but it's not true. These people are debating each other, coming up with different ideas, writing papers about it. But the idea that these guys were saying that, that this geometry implies a floor plan and that somebody had to, and, and that there's math involved and that somebody actually had to build a model. And the model could have been a drawing or it could be an actual model, but they were basically saying this is the first evidence, like the earliest evidence we have of, of basically like a uh, a scale plan that you would, you know, that you have to design it to scale so that you can then scale it up. That implies measurement systems of some kind. It's very interesting. Yeah, so I've got um, got a video here. Oh, yeah. Carahan. I don't know. Um I'm not sure. Oh, so that that's yeah. a big T pillar that has yeah. fallen over mm -hmm. with a carving of a like a fox pelt on it or something. Yeah, you can just there's just, this this thing is massive. Yeah, this central pillar, and I'm wondering too, was it? Is there a socket? See, these don't have the raised pedestals, right? Like they did at uh, at Gobekli Tepe. So, how were they standing those up, or did they just leave them? Were they actual bedrock that was just left? Yeah, standing in the middle. Could be yeah, if it was, the whole thing was rock cut. And the other thing was interesting here at Karahan is. Walking around, there were lots. There's, there is evidence of plaster. You actually can see it. There's a there's a thin film of plaster in some areas. That's it's breaking away, and you could actually walk on it in some spots. Um, it looks like a. I, at first, I thought it was some kind of a accretion on the limestone because that does happen. But the archaeologists were there were saying no, that's that's plaster. So it's there's crazy. A, there's like a big a big pot right there. This is yeah. a giant bowl yeah. stuck in the rock wall. Yeah, this place is this this enclosure is huge. Yeah. Now maybe here's here's a possibility. At Gobekli Tepe, this may all be underground. Yeah. Or under midden. Because if it's true that they came back later and built more structures, or even if they cut the bedrock down further and left two raised pedestals here and then erected uh central pillars and then stacked up pillars around and built rock walls and all that this is the thing at Quebecli tepe it is a steep slope going up like this yeah and so i wonder there's so much rubble laying in Quebecli tepe that 
that something like this that's cut directly into the bedrock to, to get down to a flat portion like this to be able to make a large flat area, this may be completely just buried in midden. And you don't see any of this anymore. Yes. That's, yeah, I agree with that. It's, I have wondered, of, you know, he, he does mention they, they had to do soundings and then they, you know, obviously had to drill holes. So they got samples for building the big, uh, giant cover. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this allowed them to, you know, they found evidence of other things, burials, bones, and PPNA and PPNB materials in these areas. Um, but I have wondered how much, you know, if they're digging out the enclosure, you know, you're starting with the, because the top of a T-pillar is sticking out of the ground. Yeah. And you start digging down in the enclosure, and then you start spreading outwards, and you find a wall. And you don't destroy the cobblestone wall because you think right. it's part of the enclosure. Well, we don't know what's behind those walls. Yeah, exactly. Yep, that's what I was thinking. That I'm trying to find a good. So and yes, people a... are asking the whole thing was carved out. Yes, like that big circular area we were just looking at was cut out of the bedrock, and then they either made T pillars elsewhere and stood them up in there, or they those were also cut out of the bedrock. Probably they stood them up. I don't know. Um, but it's the same in Gobekli Tepe. That was Karahan, and Gobekli Tepe is the same thing. They they dug through whatever topsoil was there all the way to the bedrock, and then they flattened it out in this big circle. I wonder if I can let's let's watch this. Yeah, one. let's let's take a look at it. So this is back at Gobekli Tepe. This is Enclosure C. God, these these pillars are beautiful. I know. This is uh, so these are the the rock wall. This is how it differs. Like you can see that it's similar to the way the the bedrock was cut at Karahan. It comes down. It, there's this big bench. Then it comes down, but at Karahan, the front portion of this pillar is exposed, right? The, yeah. This this first step up doesn't happen. There's a little curb, and then it goes way back to the back of the pillar and then steps up. So yeah. that's how it's a little bit different. But let's play this video. I think there's a portion. If you look at the base, here's here's all the flattened bedrock down here. This is the raised uh, pedestal. This is also bedrock. And so watch this. Um, where this connects down here. I think it may look down. I'm not sure which video it does what. Yeah, just let it play. Let's see what it does. My zoom my zoom uh, switch broke. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you can see how the t the pillars are set in these beautiful pedestals that are part of the bedrock. And so I'm going to pause it here. Okay. This is what we don't know. Like yeah, what's what, in there? Cuz here's another uh, bedrock area like how much higher is this than this bedrock area quite a bit so somewhere in here the bedrock has to step up to this le to this level yeah because this is quite a slope you know it's going downhill from right to left here and just for people who uh, didn't hear this before a very interesting aspect of this enclosure enclosure C you can see that the the two central big pillars are broken. And there's good evidence that somebody came along thousands of years after these sites were abandoned and dug down... Uh, like 4,000 years after the site. 4,000 years after the site was abandoned, they came over here and they dug a pit to expose those two central pillars and then purposefully broke them. This is called an iconoclastic event where they basically were destroying symbolism for some reason. So why? Like, why would this happen is a good question. So long after the site is abandoned, like 4,000 years later, who cares? And you know? it was, it was, and they had to dig it out to yeah, do it. They dug down, they targeted, they, the, the way the papers say, they targeted these, these pillars. Yeah. It's also found, um, we could go to the Tepe Telegrams and look at... Uh, Enclosure H. Yeah, we should do that. We should pull that one out, too. I'll play the rest of this video. But they found it at another one, and we could go there and look at uh, the... Um, there's, like, clear evidence of, like, a ramp. Yep. Goes Stairs down or whatever, yeah. But they dug to the central pillars of the cat enclosure yeah. and, and destroyed those as well. So, yeah. Who's that guy? Yeah. He doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> you can tell. <laughs> but I didn't get I didn't get this is not the video. Not I the wanted. video you want. 
These are not the videos you were looking for. <laughs> I want the one that shows that little bench. But anyway, um, yeah, I might I might spend some time looking for that. So I don't know. I don't have to do that. I just think that uh, <laughs> some people hold a grudge for a very long time. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about talk about digging up the past, right? Yeah, yeah that's not going to be it. Maybe, maybe. Let me look. No. No. <laughs> oh well. Well, I really, I really would love to get this guy on the show and talk to him. Yeah, for but sure. in the end, no matter what, no matter what papers we've read, and we read a bunch at this point, uh, including some by by Lee Claire himself, uh, and you know what, who are or interviews we've listened to with scientists working on this. In the end, all of this dating of materials, whether it's by context in in, in terms of the lithics or by actual carbon dating in terms of bits of bone, bits of animal matter, plant matter, uh, charcoal from fires, all of that doesn't tell us anything about the age of the megalithic architecture itself. That's right. And he did say, he, he did talk at the end, uh, and you and I had a brief conversation about this, where he was saying that these, these buildings are not, it's not like they just came and built a building. And then it was done. Like yeah. they were remodeling it. Yeah. They were adding all this stuff. They they reused older materials. Yeah. And then what was what did he say? It was like we don't really know what the original form of this building was supposed yes, to look like. Yeah. That's right. He said he says the hardest thing with something like this where it was occupied for a long time and then you have multiple layers of different uh styles of culture, different materials in there, and then obviously all the agricultural stuff that happened later. He's just like, we don't know what the original form of these megalithic buildings, we don't know what it was because it's been, and this is the same thing we've talked about this with Egypt. You're looking through thousands of years of changes that have been made by multiple different peoples. So we see, all we, what we see here is the most recent form of these structures that was made by the last people to use it, basically, uh, we don't know what they originally looked like, but he says that there's evidence. Was it enclosure? Uh, was it enclosure? Well, I just B want or A, where he was like one of the T pillars seems to be in there backwards. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I just yeah, want this to point one over here, out. yeah, right there. This pillar, right here. I mean, it's sitting on this yeah rock wall that does not look original. And look at look at the rock wall. Look at this edge. It clearly goes down. Yep to the bedrock and so it does the same down here I yeah wish i can get this out of the way <laughs> wait don't do that and so it looks like someone came later and like f filled this in with new materials and yeah. then stuck this column or this t-pillar on there so it's very clear that these were these were redone and then what were you pointing at um back here i think is no no no, I was just saying, oh, <laughs> this one, this doesn't look original to me either. No, you know, it doesn't. This, yeah. This thing is carved. They've built the rock wall right up to the, I mean, what? Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't think so. Um, yeah. So you're, you're talking about something on the, on this other. Yeah. Way in the back here. Uh, <laughs> we can't actually I look can't, at it. Yeah. Uh, the, <laughs> that one. Oh, he's he's talking about it's it's either in this enclosure or this one that that pillar may be in there backwards. Yeah. Oh, okay. One of these yeah. is in there backwards. Some, yeah. One of these. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So definitely, these sites were remodeled multiple times, and that's I think that's clear right upon. I mean, just walking up and looking down immediately, yeah. it's like okay, yeah, this is. Yeah, people have been messing with this for a long time. Yeah. So, do we have any more? Let's see. Uh, there was a question about human remains. Uh, Lee Claire is saying that they have found human remains at this point. Uh, there are human long bones with what he called secondary burial scratches. 
on them. In other words, you uh, do a particular kind of burial that reduces the body to a skeleton, and then you put the bones, some of the bones, in a certain place and inter other bones elsewhere. Uh, he says that they that some of the P, P, and B structures, the, the little oval and square, square uh, residential structures, have some of them have burials below the floor, which is a common practice. Um, but yeah, there are human bones. And there are even human bones, just fragments in the midden. So, okay, so this will be one of the cisterns at Gobekli Tepe. And this is right behind me is the walkway going from right to left. And to the left, you walk way up there and you get to, to Gobekli Tepe. I'm assuming there's there's two of and them And that's here. the platform out there. And then here you can see where they flattened the bedrock. There's one of the raised pedestals. Another one was here. It obviously it's it's gone or mostly gone. And there's a slot in the middle of that one. Um, so yeah, this is what they were doing. They made this little raised uh, curb going around. And then it looks like even this may be carved out for water runoff. I don't know. Interesting. Let's see if I get any better views of it. Oh, there's my hand. <laughs> totally professional camera move right there. <laughs> oh, another professional move. I think someone totally legally went and like stuck a stick down in that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. That was definitely legal. <laughs> <laughs> Did they date the bones? I don't remember him saying anything about it except that they he was associating them with PP and B. Uh, that's pretty cool. Um, another thing he talked about was the what are they? What is the word they're using for the for the infill, like the incursion of all of this mid material into the? They're using this new word. They're not calling it backfilling. It's oh, yeah. like some other word that they're using now because they actually think it's, you know, the, the like collapses yeah. of the midden that was being held back by the by the walls. And um he was talking about um ways that they uh are sort of I can't remember what it is exactly. It's something about how you can find PPNA and PPNB materials mixed up together mm -hmm. down so far so you know that it's at least as late as the PPNB material, right? So yeah. if you have a collapse and it and it has PPNB material in, it in happened the collapse. It during the PPNB period. It had to have happened at least in the PPNB period. Yeah. It could have happened later. But not earlier. Right. Because if, if the collapse had happened earlier, there wouldn't be any PP and B, B material yeah. in there. There good, would only be the point. A material. Yeah. Which I thought was a really good point. So that places these infilling periods, I think, hundreds of years after the supposed building of these things, at yeah. least. I don't, I'm, I'm not and sure. And he says in that interview that these structures, now, now they have good evidence that the structures were in use for centuries. Yeah. Yeah. So... I'd have to look up. Um, hey, Kyle. Thanks, buddy. Hey. Beer money. That's a lot of beer money, bro. All right. Thanks, I mean, bro. It, yeah. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll, it's it's Canadian. It'll buy two. Mm, mm. <laughs> You're right. You can't buy a whole lot of beers with maple leaves. <laughs> no, thanks, bro. That's, that's <laughs> way more than two. Thank you very much. That's an executive producer, uh, uh, associate executive producer, don't you? Yeah, it is. There. Yeah. I really appreciate that. Um, let's see. I was going to look up. What else you got? Any more thoughts on this? Can we move on to emails maybe? We have tons of emails. We have to tackle these eventually. We have to handle these emails, Brown. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> we could still get into it some more, but yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, we, I, we can keep talking about it if you want to, because it's, I was it's, just it's endlessly up. fascinating. Watcher is not here. Sorry, folks. Yeah, he, no, he's can't. on shift tonight. Let's he's on, see. he's on space shift. 
Okay, here we go. Let's let's look at this real quick. Okay, pre-pottery Neolithic. So 12,000 to 8,500 years ago. That's the pre-pottery Neolithic. So where does A Okay, A is from 10,000 to 8,800 BCE. So 1,200 years. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Hmm. PPMB, 880 to 6, uh, 65. Yeah. 100. So, yeah, I mean, it just depends on how early the earliest PP and A materials are that are mixed up in there. But if this started at the beginning yeah. of the PP and A, and then you've got PP and B materials mixed in the infilling, then this thing was potentially uh, not, or, or at least cleaned out, at least still being used for over a thousand years. Yeah. But see, here we go. They're, they're Urfa man. Um, Here's this sculpture on the on the column at Gobekli Tepe. It's yeah. all none of this was associated with PP and A or B before. That it was it was these lithics, you know. And I think the story behind Urfa Man is that this farmer found this thing and cleaned it up and tried to take it to the somewhere. He got on a donkey and took it yeah, all the way. I don't know if it was that one, but it was a sculpture like that. Yeah. Oh I really? I thought I, it yeah, was. Yeah, maybe it is Urfa Man. I'm just saying, I don't know. I don't remember. Anyway, they were like, yeah. no, this is this is a fake. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. They thought it was a fake and he was mad because he, so he got on his donkey thing. and went like 30 kilometers <laughs> carrying this thing to bring it to some scientists. And they were like, whatever, bro, this is fake. He got all bent out of shape and just like left it there, went home, took his donkey and went home. Yeah. So I, I could be wrong, but I think that they, they eventually did connect it to um, Gobekli Tepe. But yeah. after the, the, the yeah. excavations began in the 90s. Yeah, that's right. And they're like, wait a minute, this thing is legit. Yeah. I wonder if they ever went over there and said, sorry, dude, you were right. Probably not. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but he's it, probably one of the farmers that owns the land that this stuff is on. You know, that's... It's just weird. And I saw somebody uh, in the comments of this of this YouTube video saying, like, so these people couldn't make pottery. But they right. were making megalithic architecture. Right. Yeah, 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 I know. That is... Pre-pottery Neolithic is what we're talking about here. So, yeah, they're cutting out giant, you know... High-relief stone carvings, but they're yeah. not making... And they're making plaster. P plaster in it, For the yeah. walls. Yeah. No pottery. No pottery. Well, that's interesting. Maybe because they had beautiful stone vases. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need pottery. You need pottery for that. <laughs> tons of... Th Tens of thousands of these things yeah. laying around. Yeah. That would be interesting. Okay. I'm done. Okay. I guess. <laughs> we do have a lot of emails. Let me see what we've got here. Uh, yeah, I have All this. right. Problematic post the same pre- uh, Wait a minute. Pre pre fired. I think what you, what I was thinking what you meant. Pre pre fired pottery. I was thinking um, it was pre fired pottery because mm. if you don't fire pottery, it just turns back into mush. Yeah, after yeah. it gets soaked. Yeah, that's true. So you could make a whole bunch of stuff, but then it just once it gets buried and soaked, it's gone. It yeah. just turns back into clay. Yeah. Okay, Ed, who's got another question? What did you make of Lee Clear's idea that on what Gobekli Tepe might be? That it could be dedicated to the hunter-gatherer lifestyle because that lifestyle was phasing out. Yeah. I just, I feel like all of that is still associated with, the, it's, the, it's the problem of like. They're associating it with PP and A and B. Yeah. Now he did, he did say that it's weird that they weren't domesticating plants and animals when, you know, it was happening nearby. Yeah. Um. Maybe even a thousand years before, it was happening in uh, in the Fertile Crescent. Um, what was the place that uh, Doctor Moore excavated? The Tel Al Hammam is that? Or Maybe the, that's it. Abu Huraira. Tel Abu Al Huraira. Uh, Tel Al Hammam. <laughs> it's one of those two. Yeah, yeah. I, can't, <laughs> I get them mixed up all the time. 
I think. Uh, so yeah, I I just I feel like. Let's see. What are you looking for? I'm looking up Tel Al Hamam. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't see his name. I I don't know. Anyway, it's one of those two sites. Sorry for not being able to remember which one. But yeah, he basically discovered farming there. And that's not very far from Gobekli Tepe. It's like uh, in northern Syria somewhere. So let, hmm. let's look at this. I can pull this right back up. It's, Abu Huraira is what he was saying. Abu Huraira. So yeah. it's somewhere like down here. I don't know. It's in this. It's further down in the in this Fertile Crescent, I think, maybe. Maybe in this area. Um, but yeah, in other words, like Quebec Tepe is like up here. And, and, you know, they were discovering or they were farming like a little bit to the south maybe a hunt yeah i don't know i don't remember how far um so it was happening nearby just not at Gobekli and he tepe. does he does comment that all of the <laughs> animal carvings that are found at Gobekli tepe are wild animals none of them are domesticated but i don't i'm not sure how you can tell that Herrera. here's Gobekli tepe uh, it doesn't tell you how far that is but yeah, I mean they have boars on there. They have aurochs. Yeah, he. Was, How do they know they're not domesticated? Yeah, he's saying that they were they were just hunting. You know the gazelle. Yeah, the gazelle. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they could have. They could have been. I don't know. Um, I guess maybe they're not finding like goat bones or whatever. Yeah. Are. The other thing I thought of was trade. Yeah, I mean, they could have had a really. Now again, we're talking about in. We're talking about in the layers of midden, that were clearly deposited by the PPNA and PPNB yep. peoples. Right. Not, possibly what was there before. That's the that's the key, and 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 it it would be weird. Uh, that, if somebody went there and built this massive thing and didn't leave any kind of remains or materials or whatever from it doesn't matter what civilization was there they would have had to have left something hmm. right if you were living there yeah. there would be some evidence of that somewhere. yeah yeah if you lived there yeah but if you just showed up and you built it in one night in a fit of rage <laughs> <laughs> and then left and left yeah, yeah. <laughs> i don't know that seems weird you know or if it was two wizards that you had whistles or something like <laughs> Whatever these stories always say about some of these mysterious places, how they were built overnight by two brothers who came out of the ground, or a wizard who had a whistle, uh, or Cain in a fit of rage was supposed to have built the Baalbek platform. You know. Yeah, it's just it would it, it would just be strange that they would go all over this area in the in the. Uh... Uh, cistern implies you need a water source so you yeah can stick around for a while yeah yeah the stone hills what is it called the taj, taj tepelaire yeah that they would go all around and and build all these sites all over the place but then just leave like yeah. not stick around mm -hmm. and i just feel like no matter what even if you were there the construction crew was there yeah there would be some it's kind be of plastic water bottles and cigarette butts and if no one was living there during the building phase I mean, I mean, if it wasn't like they would be camping there or something like that yeah. while they're building, you know, you you could have trade bringing them goods. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then the place becomes occupied after that. I don't know. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Shall we hit some emails? Yeah. All right. Cool. What time we got? Also, uh, where are we at here on time? Okay. Yeah. With break, I don't know. Yeah. Hour and a half. Okay, this is uh let's see who is this from? I guess this is from I don't know. 
No name given. <laughs> it's called Giants. I have been asking all the older folks that come to my shop, mostly men, if they think there were giants. They almost all say that the mounds of America are full of them and that it used to be common knowledge. Hmm. I like to quiz people that come in with some of these questions, like, do you think people have been to the moon? Generally, they say yes. Some say no. And a few say there are people living inside the moon. Also, I've had a couple say that the first landing was faked, but the rest were real. How are the Egyptian pyramids built? Most say thousands of slaves, and the rest say aliens. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, with these eyes, I think there was different atmospheric conditions and possibly variances in gravity. Was listening to you and thinking... My favorite things to do, and the other day about how Tesla thought he could energize a layer of atmosphere. Possibly there was a time when it was energized, maybe even at a height about where some pyramid tips are. It would be interesting to know if there are an abundance of ancient buildings that reach into the same layer of atmosphere. The energized atmosphere could have been at any level in different times. You all spoke of another planet that may have transited across the solar system, possibly impacting Jupiter, causing the eye, three days of darkness, etc., well, while it was nearby, Earth, could, Earth, it could have caused a lower gravity situation, making things much easier to move, i.e. impossible ox. If it orbited near enough, maybe it could have been causing very high tides and stress volcanoes. I haven't got a solid theory together, but it's all something to ponder. Uh, also on episode 96, I've been working on getting my wife to go to Serpent Mountain, Ohio with me. It's not too far away and not on the glad level, so I think she'll go with it. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I like this that he's basically what what the reason I wanted to read this is because he's just like he's got all these people coming in and he's taking polls right <laughs> over time. Do you think there were giants? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And everybody used to know about it. You know, well, how are the pyramids built? Slaves or aliens? That's the. <laughs> this is good work. This yeah, is yeah, science, yeah, buddy. This it up. Is, yeah. <laughs> Ask him. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well. I was thinking about the Sarah PM or Gobekli Tepe, but you'd have to ex probably explain. Explain, a bunch of stuff yeah, too. yeah, yeah, yeah. Pyramids and giants is good. Yeah, I mean, you could do uh, Bigfoot. You could. Yeah, that would be one. Yeah, People, everybody's heard of that. And you can ask them about UFOs and aliens too. Yeah, yeah. Ask them those questions. Okay, this is from Michael. Uh, he says it's me, Johnson. Hello, Snake Bros. Episode 285 was excellent. Laura started off with a bang with her first guest get. Kudos. The Maya and other Mesoamerican cultures are so mysterious and fascinating. I hope this topic continues to be explored by both of you, Kyle and Russ. While anxiously, anxiously awaiting two, uh, 285 to drop, I listened to another podcast whose guest was Dr. Paulette Steves. She is an indigenous archaeologist with a focus on the Pleistocene history of the Western Hemisphere. She argues that indigenous peoples were present in the Western Hemisphere as early as 100,000 years ago and possibly much earlier. She said some things that really made my snaky senses start tingling. If I remember correctly, she said that the Clovis culture was a diffusion in technology and not people, which made so much sense to me because no Clovis people's bones have ever been found. The interviewer on the podcast, in my opinion, did not do a good job on the interview. He just gave her a few ohs and ahs and oh, that's interesting comments. I feel that if she was interviewed by you two in the Tangent Cube, then so much more can be brought to the table through conversations and asking the proper questions. Oh, thank you very thank much you. for that. Appreciate in closing, I am, I am humbly requesting that Laura contact her and try to get an interview <laughs> schedule if you all feel this would be a guest you're interested in. Thank you, Kyle, Russ, Laura, and Watcher for all you do for the Snake Force. Snakes! Warm and fuzzies from Michael. Mm. Ah. Mm. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> We're such Nailed you, bro. We're trolls, bro. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, maybe Laura will get on that. I'm sure she would love to yeah. do that. And yeah, that she's like cool really guest. been working on the guests. Yeah. Okay. It um, made me think of Dr. Ken Tankersley as well. I would love to get him. Yeah, on we got to get too. Dr. Ken on for sure. And maybe Micah. I'd like to talk to Micah Hanks. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's a long list there. Yeah. You think Moore would come on, too? I mean, he seemed... Uh, I yeah, hope so. We could get Andrew Moore on. That would be fantastic. Okay. This is called um, First Contact from Olaf. He says, Greetings from Sweden. I'm rather n a rather new fan to your podcast, but I ran into you guys many years ago. It started with the Cosmographia show you guys did with Randall Carlson, Sleepy Brad, and Silent Mike. <laughs> Sleepy Brad. 
While following Randall and after reading some of Graham's books, I got in contact with Uncharted Ben's work, and I absolutely love it. I was actually through Cosmographia that shifted my life choices and made me start to study geology at university. Oh, so a huge thanks cool. is appropriate from my part. What you guys do is very important, and it does affect people. Thank you. I have hammered through quite a lot of your backlog, and I listen to all new episodes, and here I am, completely gobsmacked. You guys are freaking amazing, and it's a joy to listen to you guys and watching your podcast. Please do more video content. No. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, we have this rule. We don't ever do what somebody from Sweden asks us to do. We just say no. <laughs> Anyways, enough with the formalities. I just missed the latest Gobekli Tepe Part 2 284 live show, but here comes a thought that arose while watching this episode. What if the people that lived and built the city slash structures at Gobekli Tepe and nearby are descendants of the civilization that built the pyramids and the other structures and artifacts in Egypt? The people either had to flee or are the survivors after a civil war or a global war that took place a long time ago. We see such destruction in Egypt, Peru, and probably also at Atlantis before it was swallowed by the sea, which would add some value to the thought of this chaotic time being a global event. When this new civilization arose at or near Gobekli Tepe, they still knew the stories and tales about their past, and or perhaps even some knowledge of their predecessors' way of working stone, although much more rudimentary, and anyway, near the skill or capacity of their past. The people living at Gobekli Tepe were, in other words, trying to imitate or rediscover the skills of their long-gone civilization, working with stone while also becoming a flourishing people. Perhaps Gobekli Tepe in some way was the cradle of civilization, as Graham writes. What makes me think there is some value to this thought, which perhaps sounds a bit backwards, is that damn vase. If a civilization first arose at Gobekli Tepe, and the pyramids and all artifacts were built after Gobekli Tepe was covered some 12,000 years ago, I just don't see it that we today wouldn't see more clearer traces of them. Um, so this is kind of what you were just saying. Where is all their stuff? Yeah. A modern civilization that rose one or 2,000 years after Gobekli Tepe was buried and had the knowledge of advanced machinery and even some sort of computer which would be required in making the stone vases would, in my mind, leave a lot more traces and remnants behind. So I think the idea here is he's saying that Gobekli Tepe, <clears throat> if I'm getting this right, that Gobekli Tepe is not a precursor to the people who built the pyramids and the vases that he's thinking must be much older because their machines should still be around if it's that recent. Mm. So now he's what he's saying is maybe the people who built the vases and the pyramids, their stuff collapsed, and then they're building Gobekli Tepe trying to recover what they lost, which is why yeah. there's good stonework, but it's not as good. So he says, I'm having a problem figuring out why Gobekli Tepe and the other nearby sites were buried. Well, this is what we've been going through, right? And this is, this is part of the mystery that was part of this site was like, why were they intentionally buried? Well, the idea now is that this is not probably the case that it was like, I think it definitely was not the case. Yeah. I mean, look, the archeologists can say that, that, that it hasn't been disproven, but to me it's, it was not intent. Maybe a couple guys threw some trash in there. That always happens. <laughs> yeah. <right? laughs> doesn't That's count. not the same thing. <laughs> yes. Some, there, there probably was a period where a bunch of people didn't care and they were just like throwing stuff on the ground or building fires inside the enclosures and just leaving and, and dirt was piling up. Yeah. You know, they're like digging out their fires and just chunking the dirt in there. That's not an intentional burial. No. I don't think any, I don't, I think basically you have to say it this way. I think it is with almost like, I'm not going to say 100%. <laughs> See? <laughs> Let's say You can't do it either. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Okay, I can't. You I can't, can't do it. You can't do it. I'm going to say this. <laughs> I think it is beyond extremely unlikely <laughs> that any group of people stood above one of these enclosures and said, let's bury that. Yeah. That didn't happen. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, people may have engaged in activities that resulted in piling up material in there, but it was not like, "Hey, let's bury this thing." Yeah. No. Anyways. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And it's uh, another thing that the archaeologists are saying is like, we have this problem now. These sites are down in the midden. And then there's these 
cobblestone retaining walls or they act as retaining walls, but we still have a problem with if it rains, then water oh, yeah. flows in and it starts filling it's clear. It starts filling the, the enclosures up with, with stuff. And if you have an earthquake, it's gonna want to collapse, you know. Yeah. So that's part of the reason for the big roof. One keep all that rain. Frickin percent. <laughs> okay. He's saying hundred percent, folks. <laughs> That's I got that from the trolls in the chat. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> oh, a hundred percent, hundred percent, hundred percent, hundred percent. Okay, so <clears throat> our buddy Olaf here is struggling with this purposeful burying. So that's what he's saying. Good. Here. Perhaps the people living at the region in GT, when they were ready, traveled back to Egypt and reestablished themselves as the rulers of the Giza Plateau and the rest of Egypt. They might even be whom the dynastic Egyptians called the followers of Horus. Before doing so, they covered up the sites even though it's a monumental task to protect it? Or was it buried with a more hostile intent and a way to hide or erase this culture from other people in the region? So in summary, pyramids and vases, chaos war, uh, survivors passing the tales and legends from the ancient war, uh, world forward for God knows how long. A new civilization rises at Gobekli Tepe and acts like a cradle of civilization. It gets covered up 12,000 years ago for some reason. And some information remains to our modern day in holy texts as examples, the pillars of Enoch or Iram, the Epic of Gilgamesh, and so on. So he says, a small side note, uh, I thought it was pretty amazing what you guys said, uh, what you said about the pillars of Enoch might be Gobekli Tepe in some way. Also, I asked my friend who is a Muslim if he knew something about this, and he said that this story or tale is also mentioned in the Quran as the pillars of Iram. Is Gobekli Tepe the place mentioned in the Holy Text, the place which God erased? Christianity, Islam, and Judaism have somewhat the same heritage. This just adds to the feel that everything is connected in a very reasonable way, especially when all have such similar stories, the pillars of Enoch, the pillars of Iram, Sodom, and Gomorrah, etc., etc. If one would want to go a bit further regarding the above, it is interesting that the Hebrews left Egypt while Ramses II was Pharaoh. He and his scribble-happy followers... <laughs> scribblers! <laughs> Lesser scribblers! Or maybe Ramses and his people were greater scribblers. Scribble happy followers perhaps was the reason for the exodus. They left in protest or were threatened because they didn't approve of the way the ruling class of Egypt was becoming, not staying true to the way of the followers of Horus, which actually was the philosophy of the people who we now know as the Hebrews. This thought really got amplified for me after hearing Graham's interview, Gods of the Bible, uh, about the translation of the Holy Scriptures. He says, Jesus this became far longer to the question I wanted to ask. So, Russ, whom I hope I understand my thoughts of reasoning while drinking your morning coffee, you guys who have been to many of the amazing places in Egypt and Turkey, would you guys think that there might be something to this way of looking at our past regarding all you have seen and read? Or is there some major flaws in my serpentine way of thinking? Would love to hear your thoughts. Best regard from Sweden. Snakes from Olaf. Well... I don't know. I agree with you that sometimes you want the story to make sense and you want to connect it all together. I love the idea of the pillars of Enoch, the pillars of Iram, uh, you know, that this there may be something to this story. We've also talked about this uh, this sort of legend about post-flood. One of Noah's sons goes and finds pillars inscribed with ancient wisdom from before the flood passed down to humans by the watchers, which is part of the reason the world was destroyed. And he reads this information, even though it's forbidden. You know, we connect that. We were talking about how people went and dug these pillars up at, uh, at Gobekli Tepe. And it's just, it's a really strange, it's strange how you have these legends or these myths or these stories that connect to these places in some way. But whether we can ever say, like, this is what happened, I, I don't think that that will ever happen. But it is, you know, interesting ideas. What are you looking for? I want to show this. Uh, if this guy is is watching this video at some point in the future, I want him to see this. Okay. So. He will watch it. Okay. So this is... Uh, Walking up to Karahan Tepe, there's my wife, Laura, right there. And this is the mound. Here's the bedrock on the left. But all of this material is man-made or human-made. Uh, you know, don't get offended, but, you know, man-made, whatever. <laughs> Anyways, this is all midden. They're excavating through... 
Occupation layers. Uh, midden material. <clears throat> All this stuff up in, in up to the right here, this is just a giant pile of midden. Yeah. On top of what basically should be roughly bare bedrock or just like you know, mostly bedrock with a little bit of grass in the cracks and crevices. There's some exposed bedrock right here. Oh, no, not that. That's actually a mid pot. Out here, you can yeah. see it way off in the distance there. There's a big piece of exposed bedrock. And when you look at the surrounding hills, that's what they look like. That's a T-pillar sticking out. And there's more. There's another one. There's another one. This is a circular, this is for sure a special building. Yep. Right here. It's a circular mound. You can see the T pillar sticking out. I scanned this and you can see sort of a circular pattern of the T pillars. It looks like somebody potholed that right there. Yep. Probably looking for the central pillars. There's another outer ring. If you look across the hill, you can see all the bedrock sticking out everywhere. On the other hill, this is all, all this light colored stuff is bedrock, bedrock, bedrock. It's just exposed all the way up to the tops. And there's just very, very little soil. But here, it's just... On this hill where Karahan is, it's covered. It's this huge midden mound. Who buried... Who? I just don't see this as even a possibility that somebody was like, hey, let's bury that. Yeah. Because they would have had to bury the entire hill. Yeah. With what material? You know, like you have to go... That would, that would require a quarry. Well, and so, then you go look at Nimrit, and you realize that they do actually bury. Yeah, they do entire bury hills. mountaintops. You're right; they do bury hills. <laughs> but that required a quarry. It did, and there it is did. a place yeah. where the rock is cut off, and it looks like. Yeah. Uh, oh, there's my bug right there. <laughs> All right, bug. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle, Kyle stops looking yeah, at rocks yeah, yeah. and starts looking, looking at, at the baby. <laughs> And then I have another one just to show you at Gobekli Tepe, but I wanted you to get that view because that here here's well before that this is a distant look at at Karahan. We're driving up in the bus. Oh yeah, this is great, right? So the all the hills that you can see surrounding this area are much lighter colored. This is a deep green. It's got the same grass as like in the valleys. Nope, oh, there's a lot of noise. Uh, but yeah, this thing is massive. And these little peaks on top are the rock stacks that the, the cairns that the yeah that the uh, you know local, the sheep herders local or sheep herders have, have built. Yeah. So this is all exposed bedrock right here. I mean that even low, down at the ba a bottom, yeah, there's exposed bedrock. Just a little bit of a rise right there, and you get all this bedrock sticking out. And I'm sure there might be some midden material up there. But this is just unreal. Yeah. This is huge. And that area is like the excavation area. Um, it's just massive. So uh, I'll show you one more if I can find my cursor. There we go. Uh, of Gobekli Tepe just walking up to it. And and this is why it's just like this is unimaginable that, that someone or some group of people would say, let's bury that. People are asking about water. So when you're standing up on these hills at Karahan or at Gobekli, you look down the hill and you can clearly see where there used to be rivers. But I don't know about lakes. You know, maybe sometime you could. But there were definitely old rivers that are now dry um, that run past these hills. But in the case of Gobekli Tepe, the nearest one is two kilometers, two or three kilometers from the site. That's a, you know, that's a lot of hiking to carry water. Let's see if I got this. What is this? Okay, yeah, this is it. All right. So first I'll show you um, driving up in the bus to from the visitor center to uh, Gobekli Tepe. This is what the hills look like. Yeah. Very little 
soil. All the way to the top, especially at the top. Yeah. It's, it's mostly <clears throat> exposed bedrock. And now you can see, like, in the foreground here, you see quite a bit of grass. But, I mean, every step, you know, the grass is literally growing out of, like, holes and pits and, and cracks in the limestone. There's almost no soil. Uh, it, definitely not a place where you could go get loads of it. So immediately you're just like, well, where would you get the material? I mean, you'd have to go all the way to the valley. And I think to, to, to do something, to bury something as, as massive as the site of Gobekli Tepe would require a, a, a quarry. So I'm looking back down the hill and then I'll turn around and, and look up at the mound. There's the flattened area we talked about out front. Yeah, so this, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that this, you'll see a little bit more of this. Uh, this may be where, I'm wondering if this is where the archeologists have been dumping material, but it looks like it's on the mound. Yeah. But yeah, that's huge. This thing's 300 meters in diameter. Yeah, that's the mound. mound up there. You can see the, the roof of Gobekli Tepe out there in the distance. But all that stuff is mound. And it's actually, even though it's on top of this hill where most of the hills all around are barren, this is so fertile up here because of all the midden material that they've got orchards. So that's just, that is a monumental undertaking. And so, again, if you think about this as midden, in other words, it's it's cultural layers. It's deposits of stuff that people brought to the site. So let's say they built this, this midden accumulated. And then someone decided, well, let's dig up this midden and bury one of the enclosures. It would have taken thousands of years to accumulate. Yeah this amount of midden so you're still talking about much much later people than the original builders burying it because the first time anyone ever came to this hill it would have looked like the rest of them and if the rest of them had a little bit of soil on top of them you know it would have also had some soil but uh if they were bare like this back then this hill would have looked the same and so they would have started building on it before there was midden. Yeah. Unless they've got the dating completely wrong and there was this huge midden pile and then someone dug down to the bedrock and started yeah. making this this structure and then it and then it collapsed and all the midden material fell back in and so Gobekli Tepe is actually way that's, younger. That's the answer. Than it is. The cobblestone the walls with the mortar on them that have been dated were already there these little circles. And somebody dug all the way down to those cobblestone walls and then put the T-pillars in. Yeah, that's the problem. Is they dated the mortar. <laughs> yeah. And it has, the, the mortar has chunks of, of uh, plant material in it that is uh, 12,000 years. I mean, it matches the dating of the. Yeah. And there's the olive orchard on the side of the midden. Yeah. It's got that much soil that you can plant on it. And there's nowhere else. There's no olive orchards on the sides of these hills. No. This is the only place where there's orchards up high. The rest of them, if there's trees, the trees in this area are almost all planted by man, and they're down in the valleys. Next email. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for that, Olaf. It's full of good questions. Oh, this is a little, this is a short... A poem, I think, from Loki. Thanks for being awesome is what it's called. Brothers <laughs> of the Serpent, unearth secrets beyond time and place, across van vast lands and empty space. Their wisdom echo echoes like a bell, tales of ancient lore they tell, from pyramids to caves amidst the oceans and waves, their knowledge spans all of man's grand plans. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Thank you. <laughs> Except that we don't know anything. That's the problem. <laughs> We don't have any knowledge. But yeah, thank you for that. And this one is called... Uh, this one's called Gratitude uh, from Texas Beth. 
says, I found you two wonderful snakes through Randall Carlson. I've been in Velikovsky for 20 years. I've read everything Zachariah Sitchin and Von, and Van Daniken, Von Daniken. I've even read the Fortean Chronicles. In short, I've always been one of those airheads who believed in UFOs and government conspiracies, and my family has made fun of me. Now I don't feel so lonely because I feel like I found my real family. I love you guys so much, and I'm trying to catch up on all these years of podcasts. I've spent weeks and weeks in the hospital over the past year, and you have helped me past, past many uncomfortable hours lying in strange beds, just watching the clock and trying to hang on until it was time for the next dose of pain medication. Ooh. I broke my back first, and two months later I developed cervical instability and was fainting on my feet with no warning, fainted going down the stairs, and there was another surgery on my neck. Mm. Then I developed multiple ulcers from taking Advil for the pain, and a week ago I began bleeding out, and I didn't even have blood pressure when I got to the ER. I had to be life-flighted to Houston for emergency surgery and had three units of blood transfused, so my family ought to be happy now. They had basically disowned me because I refused to get the planned uh, the jab. Okay. I was sure it was blood from vaccinated people. I'm pretty sure I'm pretty much dead, and I didn't care. I was. I was tired of struggling and hurting. I wasn't allowed to be with my mother last year when she was passing away from pulmonary fibrosis at 95. But I'm the closest geographically to my 97-year-old dad, and he came as close to apologizing as I've ever witnessed him doing. And now I'm his major caretaker when I'm not in the hospital. My point was going to be, I laughed for the first time in months when I found your podcasts on YouTube. I have binge listens for months. And you have helped me recover emotionally while I've been recovering physically. I still crack up over the horn flakes thing every time I pour my dad's <laughs> cereal. I know there are no accidents or coincidences. Some force gifted me with the wonder of the snake bros and you enabled me to scratch up some interest in life when there was none. <sighs> Thank you. Uh, so, let's see. When I was seven, I looked out my playroom window at night. This was on the second story of the house. It was dark, but there was a light on the porch below, and there was a weird clown-looking thing dressed like Yogi Bear staring at me. He had the little derby hat and a tie like Yogi, but it was scary as hell. I suddenly felt this deja vu horror. We had just moved from Louisiana to Texas, and my thought was, oh shit, it found me again. I don't remember anything else till the next day. As a result of this and some other high strangeness growing up, I'm pretty much non-judgmental and open to all things paranormal. I know something else is out there. I never told my family that. They would, they would have institutionalized me for sure. And I just realized this past week in the hospital that I would have paused a podcast about UFOs in the past when nurses, etc., et et came into my room. But I don't care anymore. It's not Looney Tunes anymore. It's reality. <laughs> I'm just hoping Yogi Bear doesn't show up. But if he does, you heard it first here. He's about 16 feet tall. <laughs> I have some things I would, I've found I would love to tell you about. I apologize for the already extensive and lengthy nature of this communication. I'll put it in another email someday. When I get well, I'd love to drive over and taste wine and hunt for arrowheads. Snake love for ether, forever. <laughs> you are in my heart wherever I slither. Thank you for being there uh, and for being there for me. I want to be your snake sister. <laughs> wow. wow. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Man, uh, I'm sorry for your, uh, you know, the struggles. Yeah. But some of that sounds pretty familiar, too. Yes, yeah. it does. And, uh, yeah. Hope you, hope you can get through it. And I'm glad we can make you laugh and yeah. all that. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And I understand the whole, like, you know, listening to something to get through long nights in the oh, hospital. Yeah. Absolutely. I've been there. Yep. Definitely been there. And the high strangeness stuff, you know, you say this like it was Yogi Bear, he's wearing a weird tie and like, but this is like, this is classic with this kind of stuff. This is what I think is fascinating about it is that it's that kind of story that would, you know, at least earlier in ufology, it would have been ignored because it's too weird, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you want, no, we want a little strange alien beings. We don't want <clears throat> Yogi, a 16 foot Yogi Bear with a purple <laughs> tie, but it, it happens, you know, people have these encounters. Okay, what time we got? Where are uh, we at? Whoops, wrong monitor. Uh, and All right, yeah. maybe one more. Yeah. This is wrong, remember? I forgot to hit record. Yeah. I'm going to have to pull the audio from YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this is called the Boneyard Indication of the Tarot Impact from uh, Luke, who's also a mammoth murderer in the Discord. Mammoth murder. <laughs> No, that's not what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, snakes. I was just perusing the Boneyard Alaska Instagram, John Reeves, and I see he has photos of elk skulls with their antlers attached. 
Given that elk only have hard antler for a portion of the year, it's a solid indication of the time of year in which it died. Wow. That's cool. The time of year when they have fully formed antlers just happens to be in the fall, as does the torrid meteor stream. Mm. He also has found a large, hard tree nut, which would have also formed in the fall. However, that could have just been from a previous year and got caught up in the mix. It would be curious to see, out of the thousands of skulls he has found, if the elk and deer species have antlers attached consistently. Wow, that's a really good point, dude. I've just never heard anyone mention anything of the sort, so I thought I would toss in my two cents. Okay, bye. Snakes! Luke. <laughs> we're totally stealing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're going to claim, we're going to tell Randall, hey, we have this great idea. <laughs> we're claiming that credit was for that, definitely, bro. we thought of it. <laughs> Thanks, Luke. That's fantastic. No one will ever know it was you. <laughs> yeah, you can't have a name like Mammoth Murder and expect us to give you credit. <laughs> <laughs> That's genius. It is genius, yeah. It's cool that I came up with that. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Those are good emails. I think we're done, right? Yeah. What about uh, producers? We have some producers from the show here. Well, we... that's what I was going to say. I, yeah. I Actually, we can do some uh, – this is what I was going to think we should do, basically. Okay. If we're doing a live stream, then we then we just, like, credit any – Okay. Producers on the live stream, and then for the recorded shows, we do producers for the uh, pyramid scheme. Yeah. What do you think about that? That's a good idea. Yeah. All right. Meeting adjourned. <laughs> <laughs> Meeting adjourned. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for being in the live chat. It's always fun. Enjoyed it. Thanks for the yeah. questions. One day we'll start a live show on time with everything figured out where everything works and we hit all the buttons right. I but bought a new board. Not today. <laughs> we got a new board and then I realized, well, I found out it's not going to get here until September because Yamaha just released it and then they're like, well, we actually haven't shipped them out yet. So yeah. The suppliers are like, yeah, we'll put it on the market. And so I'm on a list. <sighs> just, but, just another one of the many lists that you're on. <laughs> yeah, we're working on it. It's I, uh, I really want to ramp up the live production abilities here yeah it's fun more cameras moving our stuff around yeah do it live yeah do it live all right guys thank you so much uh i think ben just released a a new video it's supposed to be the full version of his presentation that he gave at the cosmic summit his presentation which i have seen pretty much in its entirety uh i've seen the whole the whole thing he gave at some of the egypt tours mm -hmm. egypt trips and then he's added some, a lot of the stuff from the vase. It's called um, A Tale of Two Industries. A Tale of Two Industries. It is absolutely fantastic. Uh, you can see what he delivered at the Cosmic Summit. If you go, uh, I'm sure he's got his affiliate link somewhere in his videos or on his website. Uh, but also, he's just premiered this new video from him. And I think he said it's almost three hours long. So uh, go check it out. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's got the entire thing that he wasn't able to do at the Cosmic Summit. Which is hilarious because him and I had this back and forth like, oh, you get you work on your presentation, bro. I'm like, it was yeah, man. still great though. Yeah, I'm I mean, like, yeah, I've got mine down to 50 minutes. He's like, what? You timed it? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I practiced it a couple times. Did you practice yours? Oh no, I'm wrong. I'm fucking, I'm gonna fucking do it. <laughs> and then he gets up there at the summit. He gets halfway through and he's like, oh, I just needed like 20 more minutes. Nope. It's definitely two hours and 40 minutes long. <laughs> anyway. Um, I didn't even realize it until he said later that like he only got halfway through. I yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, because he, he has the whole conclusion, right? He finished the vase stuff, and he yeah. was already 15 minutes over his time, yeah. and he finished the vase stuff. and like, But all the, the, all the conclusion stuff that he does for the Tale of Two Industries. I can't wait to watch it. Yeah. So you guys definitely check that out. Uh, Ben's fantastic. And uh, yeah. If you want to see the other presenters, uh, Cosmic Summit, it is worth it. All the videos are there. Kyle's been working on the audio, so some of that's going to be fixed in the near future, hopefully. Right? Yeah, it's just, I mean, I've I've done, like, a little bit of just tweaking. It's Tweaking, yeah. In other words, there's nothing wrong, really, like, too wrong or bad, but I just, you know, I'm listening to it, and I'm like, okay, I can just put a little compressor there and just do a little, yeah. just kind of make it better. Yeah. And then, of course, Chris Cottrell. Is yeah, just yeah like, power went out. <laughs> he's like, so basically, this is just like, he's like, oh. yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, he didn't get to finish it. So he recorded a, a, an addendum to finish it. I'm, I put that together. 
Yeah, so I'm just doing a little bit of stuff. Yeah. But it's uh, it's all great stuff, and it's it's up. Uh, I'll be just kind of tweaking it and throwing in some extra. Yeah, so, you, so what I was saying is uh, Kyle's tweaking it. It's going to be, uh, you know, some, some of that will be updated. But all of it's available. Like I said, you can get it through Ben's affiliate link or ours if you want. The link to the to our affiliate purchase for the Cosmic Summit is in this video's uh, show notes. Um, so, yeah, thank you, guys. We really appreciate it. Uh, all the support, everybody in the chats. And like I said, I'll just say this one more time. It is harvest season. Whether we're going to be able to do a podcast every week, we don't know, but we will try. And uh, meanwhile, thank you guys for being out there. We love you. Always have. Always will. Good night, Adamu. Get back to work. You know, I think I want to grow my hair out, man. <laughs>